Over the decades, we've enjoyed a solid handful of references to HBCUs and Black Greek life and pop culture. You could not tell me Hillman College wasn't real when I was a kid. And I am so glad social media didn't exist when I was trying to recreate that drumline scene. Y'all know the one? And while we swooned over Janelle Monae's Electric Lady music video and played bootleg recordings of Beyonce's Coachella performance on loop until we had the chance to play the Netflix documentary on loop, we can't all the way relate, actually. I mean, to be clear, we are not these guys. But we attended a PWI and didn't pledge a black sorority. Was that a mistake? We want to look past romanticized ideas of house parties and step shows and understand the impact that these institutions still have today. To do that, we have to understand the history of black people in the United States seeking higher education. Remember when we talked about reconstruction after the Civil War? The emancipation of enslaved people brought with it the challenge of building a new society in which their humanity is now recognized. Friedman's Bureau Hotline, how can I assist you today? All right, all right. Oh, so you want to know if we have a database of schools that actually accept black students. All right. Right. No, they definitely wouldn't do that. Let's try, let's try this. Hi, so sorry. Um, yeah, I will have to get back to you uh, once a school like that exists. Black folks weren't allowed to attend existing universities, so they had to form their own. The first colleges for African Americans were mostly established by black churches with the support of the Freedmen's Bureau and the American Missionary Association. The AMA was a non-denominational abolitionist group founded in 1846. And during Reconstruction, they founded 11 colleges, including Houston Tillotson University here in Austin, Texas, and together with the Freedmen's Bureau, Howard University. We personally may not have an HBCU connection, but we got the PBS hookup and toured Howard thanks to our friends at PBS member station, WHUT. Hey y'all, so I am here in Washington, D.C. on Howard University's campus at WHUT, and I'm here with my friend, Mikkel, um, the Creative Services Manager here at WHUT, the first and still only HBCU licensee of a public broadcast station. So I will be taking E out on these streets. Yeah. So we're gonna make sure that we can get the gist of this campus. There you go. For those of you who don't know, fun fact, Howard was actually founded by a, um, a white guy. So Howard is named after Union General Oliver Otis Howard, who was at the time the commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau. Oh, he was about it. In as much as a white guy in post-Civil War US could be about it. But he invested something into the university or into our experience mm -hmm. that we would not have gotten. That's sometimes what you need is that first step to make something as amazing and as valuable as Howard. While it's not the oldest HBCU in the country, that title goes to Shaney University of Pennsylvania. Founded in 1837, it was originally called the African Institute and then the Institute for Colored Youth. The Times. Howard's brand recognition comes from its impressive alumni, making it an epicenter of culture. So this is how change tends to happen. People take action and legislation follows. It doesn't quite fit, people take more action, and legislation is updated. It's these series of steps over time that create what future generations see as progress. The first HBCUs were private, funded by religious or philanthropic groups and individuals. But in 1890, the second Morrill Land Grant Act specified that states using federal higher education funds must provide an education to black students, either by opening the doors of their public universities or by establishing new schools specifically to serve black students. Now this is almost 70 years before we even get to the integration of our alma mater. In 1928, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools began formally surveying and accrediting HBCUs. It wasn't until 1965, almost 100 years after a school like Howard was founded, that the Higher Education Act of 1965 formalized the HBCU definition, officially recognizing their contribution to education. 
Today, there are 105 HBCUs. They enroll 11% of black students in the US while only representing less than 3% of colleges and universities in the country. Let that sink in. Though HBCUs were founded to educate black Americans, anyone seeking education, regardless of race, can enroll. But think about it. How cool is it to say your university has a legacy of wanting to educate you? Not through protest, but from the very beginning. And scholars have studied what HBCUs provide through community cultural wealth. School isn't just about academics, it's also about adjusting to a new and somewhat controlled environment. And if you feel socially estranged, alienated, or even threatened by your peers, it can take a toll on you and your grades. So it's no surprise that according to a report from the National Science Foundation, eight of the top 10 U.S. institutions producing black undergrads who went on to earn science and engineering doctorates were HBCUs. So this is the Valley, um, known to most Howard students as the Valley. Mm -hmm. It's the home of all of our sciences. So biology, chemistry, physics, mm -hmm. um, and even pharmacy. But this is where we make doctors. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you have to say for that decision that 18-year-old Halise made? I wanted to become a filmmaker, more specifically a feature film editor, and the University of Texas at Austin was the only affordable film program I knew about at the time. It really did come down to monetary resources and income for me, which I think is something a lot of students have to work through. P.S. Thank you mom and dad for not cutting my funding. Look at your girl now, look at me. We out here. <laughs> what about you? So imagine my surprise when I learn after the fact that an HBCU is literally down the highway from yeah. us. So. Admittedly, I was a teenager who was influenced by name recognition. Nobody from an HBCU came to my high school during those college fairs. I didn't know any alumni, and I always assumed HBCUs were private, out-of-state schools, which I could not afford. And affordability is an issue that can come up among those seeking higher education. HBCUs, just like PWIs, have received their fair share of scrutiny when it comes to financial aid and available resources to their students. But who knows though, if someone told us all this in high school, I could have been a bison or like a rattler. I also regret not participating more in black Greek life while attending college. As we mentioned before, it all adds up to a collective of community cultural wealth, and I missed out on establishing potential professional relationships. While I didn't pledge a sorority, black Greeks were my social life saving grace. Their events encouraged academic excellence, made sure I was aware of resources, and yes, parties. I attended all the parties. Greek life started here, really, because if it stayed at Cornell, we're not sure how well it would have caught fire, you know, because mm. it's a PWI, um, yes. and there's a, in 1906, there's a very limited amount of African Americans that were going to Cornell University. So without Howard sparking that fire, Greek life may or may not have even happened. So yeah, and then kudos. it would have never trickled down to where I went to school, University of Texas. Woo! So as in Longhorn? Yep. The National Panhellenic Council was formed on May 10, 1930, and included the Omega Psi Phi, Kappa Alpha Psi, Alpha Kappa Alpha, Delta Sigma Theta, and Zeta Phi Beta. The following year, Alpha Phi Alpha and Phi Beta Sigma joined, and by 1997, what we now call the Divine Nine was complete, with the additions of Sigma Gamma Rho in 1937 and Iota Phi Theta in 1997. The mission of the Divine Nine is unanimity of thought and action, as far as possible in the conduct of Greek letter collegiate fraternities and sororities, and to consider problems of mutual interest to its member organizations. Basically, it's like Harry Potter. Oh. You can be a Hufflepuff or a Gryffindor, gotcha. but at the end of the day, y'all all read Hogwarts. And like the wonderful wizarding world, they're all down for some friendly competition. My name is Taylor Smith. I go to the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. So Delta has been present all my life. Um, I'm not a legacy, so with me, it was that organization was heavily influenced in my community. So those are the women that I saw doing most of the community service in my uh, community, my school teachers, people that was like sponsors in certain organizations. So they was like heavily influenced. So that was what made me want to go that route. So strolling what basically looks like an outside dance. So it looks like a lot of people are in a dance, doing similar moves. The significance of strolling, to me personally, I feel like it's a, a form of unity, showing that we're all doing something together. 
and there are certain, like I said, those nine black big organizations, but then you have several different chapters that follows under those organizations. So you may have one chapter, they have a certain stroll that they do that everybody knows, oh, this is that chapter that's doing that. It's because of their history that HBCUs are still relevant today. Classroom discrimination, hiring bias, salary inequality, the chances of finding someone who can guide you through these issues is higher at an HBCU. Your network is your net worth. Preach. The community you cultivate through higher education goes on to impact your adult life and connect you to people you haven't even met yet. There have been connections that's been formed. I've met a lot more journalists because I'm a journalist major. In a, a college undergrad year, don't let not being a part of an organization or a Greek organization in general stop you from building those connections. Um, so however you were before you came into the Greek world is how you're going to be once you go into the Greek world. So if you was that person that's making those connections before, you're going to be the same person. <laughs> so if you had to give anybody watching that final push, to come to an HBCU, what would you say? First, I'm not gonna push you to go to an HBCU. Mm -hmm. The choice is yours. Um, it's, and just like anything else, not for everyone, but if you were to choose or you're thinking about Howard University, the historical value is not what you're going to rest on. What you make of this experience is what grows the university is what makes HBCUs. So definitely do not choose Howard University or any HBCU just because of the legacy. Build on its future. So come in with a purpose, come in with intent, choose it because you value it and give it your all. That is good. Back to you for us. Just as a Harvard grad will perk up a little bit more when a fellow Havardian walks into an interview, or if someone in a building yells, Texas, fight. At the end of the day, choosing an institution for your higher education is a big decision that only you can make. HBCUs have a prestigious legacy of doing what literally no other school wanted to do, educate us. For that reason alone, we can go ahead and dead these HBCU versus PWI Twitter wars. We all got student loans and made decisions based on what we thought was best for us at the time. As with any institution, you get what you put into it. So join organizations, don't cut class, don't break a stroll line, and get to know your peers because you never know. You just might end up producing a PBS Digital Studio show with one of them. In the comments, we want to hear from y'all. If you're headed to an HBCU, tell us why you picked it. And if any alumni are watching, drop some wisdom in the comments because we need them to focus on these books, okay? Give this episode a like, subscribe, and follow us on social media at Say It Loud PBS. And click here to watch Soundfield explore New York's underground ballroom scene, including voguing and musical crashes. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.